It's not going to work out. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, thank you. So uh, this morning we're going to talk, be talking about court governance. And this is one of those competencies that each one of us as court leaders in our organizations uh, need to understand and be adept at performing. And as I said it earlier, you think of court government, governance excuse me, as the umbrella. It is the umbrella from which everything in your organization can and should flow, whether those are policies and procedures um, and how your, your business, and I call court a business, excuse me, but how your business is running. It has to do with per, per, uh, policies of your staff and your employees. All those things can emanate from court governance. And it is challenging, there is no doubt, because, and we'll talk about this as we, we go forward, some of the things that challenge us as court leaders to have an effective governance structure. Um, and we'll walk through as we go through this today, quickly I'm afraid, but I will all keep referring you back to the curriculum, which you can find online at, at the NACOM website. We'll give you more instruction and information. If you are right now, if you're saying to yourself, you know, this is one of those things I need to be a little bit better at. How do I get better at this? My court needs improved governance. How do we do that? And so the curriculum was written really to, to take you step by step through the things you need to do, think about, and work on as you move forward for an effective governance um, system. I'm going to touch this. Um, this is the slide's kind of out of place. I'm going to touch on this in more in detail a little bit later. But I believe it is critically important, and I'll tell you why I believe that is the case. Um, so today, um, this is some of the reasons, excuse me, the framework, as I said before, um, providing consisti consistency and predictability. How important is that to you in your court? Why? Why is that important? Anybody? Because I'll probably pick on this group here, but. <laughs> Helps you get ahead of what might come up. Okay. Others? Why is that? I'm sorry? To whom? To whom? Please. Oh, I'm sorry. Jeez, I have a problem with this. Um, anyone else? With the public as well. Helps with the public as well. We'll go through each one of these more in detail to, to explain as we go through uh, this morning. So today, and, and today and part of the curriculum, these are the learning objects, objectives, excuse me. You need to be able to define court governance and the principles and the structure. Describe the role and importance, and we'll talk about that in detail. Um, be able to identify different governance models. Every one of us in this room comes from a different court, and you are organized and constructed, if you will, differently. There is no one governance model that fits all. Um, and you need to under, we need to understand that and be able to modify our structures to meet our local culture. Be able to conduct an organizational readiness assessment. Within the curriculum at the end, and we'll talk about it again later, is, is this an assessment that you can use and take to give you some guidance on where your court is at with respect to governance. Um, and then develop and implement a, a, a governance structure. So with that, um, any questions on that, what we're intending to do today, as well as what is intended through the curriculum? Okay, Marcus? Too, if I can. And Ray has told me that I'm going to give you 100 years of history, okay, in three minutes. Is that so okay with everybody? And then, we'll, yeah, and then we'll kind of walk through these principles. There are seven principles we really want to uh, share with you and take a minute on those, which I think will be helpful. Anybody re recognize this guy, Roscoe Pound? Okay, thanks. Anybody read this seminal piece of his, this speech? So most of you, okay. The interesting thing, just real quickly, a botanist by profession, never took a law class in his life, passes the bar, okay. So a very brilliant man, but he wrote a lot about backlog and delay and how that would sort of erode the confidence. I think we're familiar with that and we still have those issues. But he also talked about the way courts are structured. And it really bothered Roscoe Pound that one judge was really busy, right? And down the hall or maybe the next block over, that judge didn't have any work to do, right? 
And it also concerned him that the public was totally confused about the probate court and the family court and the uh, limited jurisdiction courts and whatnot. So a lot of emphasis, if you read through that, on the structure of the courts when you think about the public service, but also where they're organized administratively. So it's really, it sounds funny, but I recommend it's, good, it's a good read and the competencies go into a little more detail on that. And then fast forward, uh, this morning I know Mike Baker mentioned to us uh, uh, Warren Berger, okay, and uh, kind of one of my heroes, but in the late 60s, and he had a speech and said, we actually have more trained astronauts than we do court managers, right? And that, that was really, it's funny if you think about it, but it was kind of a call to action. And so with that then, yeah, thanks. With that then, you see kind of uh, these new organizations are developed, the Institute for Court uh, uh, Management, uh, National Center for State Courts, and uh, yeah, there's not listed here, but say even the American Judicature Society, all these various groups kind of came to the forefront. And uh, we start to see a lot of standards development. And the first sets of standards involve time standards, maybe jury management standards, that type of thing. And you all are familiar with those, right? But to me, and it was great work, they were very mechanical, okay? Kind of like we're gonna start the clock, time the case and whatnot. And it wasn't until about the 80s we have the judicial um, national uh, trial court performance standards. And it's a much more holistic approach. It's just terrific, I think, where they start to talk about access to justice and fairness, procedural fairness and the like. And so um, governance, you'll see, is really predicated on a, a lot of those kind of um, principles, if you will, to kind of maximize uh, the uh, performance of the court. And we also started to see at this point some federal money made available. Uh, this morning they mentioned the State Justice Institute, but also a lot of money in the criminal justice sector. When you think about BJA, NIC, those kind of um, uh, fund sources that can be used, especially with integrated criminal justice and the like. Um, and we mentioned these organizations. Um, so there are some principles there that we kind of see listed there uh, when it comes to somebody talked about the staff. One of you mentioned it's really important for the staff and for the public to understand how are uh, policy decisions made, right? Who makes those decisions? And then trying to have as much stakeholder input as possible in that process. And so trying to include the public, the, the customers we serve and the like, and then uh, of course uh, to be inclusive in that process. Uh, you'll see to the left there, um, the need to fold in the purposes of courts. Remember Ernie Friesen, our purposes of courts. Make sure we have fidelity with those uh, purposes, kind of keep our true north. Um, and also, I'm gonna touch real briefly on loosely coupled systems. Do, do folks know about that? I see some heads nodding. So that, that's an interesting kind of a new framework that I think can be helpful. Um, these principles, I, I think, uh, I, I am gonna encourage you again to kind of look at the materials, but the first uh, indicates that um, you really do wanna make it clear how do all these committees work? How do we make decisions in this court, right? And some of your committees, I think, maybe even have a standing executive committee. Others, uh, it may be a team that kind of, but make sure that's really clear to everybody how that's set up. And the second principle is when you look at your leadership, it should not be based on popularity. And I've worked in some systems where everything is by seniority, right? The senior judge gets the best windowed office looking at Lake Michigan, <laughs> okay? and. Uh, the idea here is you want, to, uh, not just with the uh, judges, but with our staff, you want to base this on merit and you want to look at folks that have done uh, collaboration with other um, parts of the government. They've actually been active in the bar and the like. Um, and then you want to try to separate, if you can, in that third principle, the big, huge policy directions and then let the court administrators, the court managers, uh, kind of run with it, right? Run the day-to-day -day operations of the court. So that's a really important principle. And I think courts that have achieved that, and I think we're, we're, Ray, where you work, I think that is very clearly delineated. That's that's a game changer then, because then you can start to really be a very high functioning, you, I think the court can move much faster on some of those initiatives we mentioned. Um, management control, the, the notion here is that if we are good managers, we can actually control the budget, right? A lump sum budget, use our resources in a good way, not have the executive branch or legislative branch doing our day to day money management and the like. And so you want to have really sound governance to go ahead and operate in that manner. Um, trying to um, organize, this is Roscoe Pound again, right? Just make sure the, the enterprise is organized in sort of a thoughtful way that uh, it's not just for our convenience, but what makes most sense to the, the customers we serve, uh, to the general public and whatnot. And then there's, they're kind of calling for a big picture here in number six to say, when you start to think about a judgeship, that is such a precious resource. Think about it. it's almost like the surgical suite at the hospital, right? It is so, 
it's our best equipment, it's our best resources, it's our best thinking. So try to look at that from a system-wide approach okay, across your whole court where you folks work, or in, if you can, across the whole state to say, how do we want to line up these judges, associate judges, magistrates, and likewise with our staff to be really thoughtful about that. And there are all kinds of weighted caseload studies and so on, but I, I have the sense that sometimes we kind of just we kind of work on history, or we've always had 20 judges down in the family court, right? And so, but this is a chance I think to be really thoughtful. Um, and then um, you certainly want to have a, a, a good workforce, and we'll talk about that. And, and it's really tough right now, isn't it? I don't know any of you folks. Everybody wants to work at home, right? And they and they would like to have flexible schedules, and of course they need a 25% pay raise to keep up with inflation, right? So. Yeah, I, I get that there. Um, so, let's see, Ray, I think it's just come back to you for a bit. Yeah, go ahead. We're gonna get these mics straightened out here yet, okay? So, anybody wanna add anything to all the, the those principles or any of that? Just anything that comes to mind for you folks? Okay, well do chime in folks, and we're gonna get audio straightened out here yet. So go ahead, Ray. I turned mine off, I'm, I'm on this, can I have the clicker? Okay, so let's now get to the heart of this stuff. So why is court governance important? So let me take a poll. Hold, you can answer that question in a second. Thank you. So let me just take a poll. How many of you in here come from a court where you believe you are well governed? You have a governance structure in place and you believe it works effectively? Wow. So the rest of you aren't sure or you're not? <laughs> So how many, be honest, we're not, you won't be seen, don't worry. Um, how many of you feel, oh, we need some work there? We need to do better at how this court is governed. So the rest of you are not sure. Okay, so let me go back to the ones who said yes, we have a good governance structure. Tell me why, tell us why you think that is the place. Kevin, I saw your hand up. Why do you think your court is well governed? to that, they're willing to let go of the day-to-day -day operation and let the administrators adm manage the administration of the court. Who else said they're well governed? Yes, sir. Um, thanks, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> As a judge, thank you. As a judge, it depends on the size of the court and how many people that you have to manage. And coming from and know when to step back and when you need to step forward. Now, it's easy for me as a judge to say, all right, we're going to have a meeting and everybody's going to be here at 1230 and everybody's going to show up. My court administrator may not be able to have that clout, but then when I get everybody in the room, they run go forward. So it's understanding that symbiotic relationship going back and forth. So one other person who said, yes, we're well governed. Are you willing to share? Tell us why. Who was it? One more? Come on, volunteer. Please. Good morning. Uh, so I, would, I will just tap on to what the judge and, and the court administrator here said. And, I think we have a very symbiotic relationship between judges and administration and staff. So I think it is letting the judges be judges um, and upholding the independence of the judiciary and then letting the administrators administrate staff and support staff and educate staff and also supporting the knowledge of staff and increasing their knowledge so that they can do their job for the public, so that when the public comes in, they know what they need, they get what they need, and that way, hopefully, the judges can do a better job at being judges. Thank you. All right, so on the other side, and I don't be critical, but for those of you who said, ah, we need some work, tell us why. What, what needs work? 
I just believe that uh, there needs to be more of a formal structure in the sense that if there's turnover between the judiciary and staff on a substantial basis, that there needs to be some sort of training or blueprint in place so that when there is all that turnover, that there would be a, um, a period where you would be able to know what you need to do to get back up and running correctly. Um, you know, I know with our court right now, um, we don't have a judge in our area that has been there for a full term yet. And so when you have eight different judges that have been turned over in that amount of time, that makes it a huge loss of information immediately. And unfortunately, there's no carryover to the new judges, unfortunately. Thank you. Mark, I saw your hand up. Will you care to share? Yeah, I, I just think that there are always opportunities for improvement. So however well you think you're currently governed, it's just my personal opinion that you can always do better. That, that's why I chimed in there on the second thing. I just, yeah. I'm, I'm in that category as well. I, I think we have a very good governance structure, but can we be better? Yes, we can. Um, on our, and we'll talk about some of those things. So I know we have one judicial officer. Do we have any other judicial officers in the room? So, so, so I'd like to, <laughs> sir, um, your honor, what is your perspective on governance? What, what do you think is, in your mind, good governance for your court? Can you pass that? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, much of what's been said, but just, uh, I guess, a clear division of, so much division of labor, but uh, task uh, functions and um, trying to, I guess, put, sticking to the, the timelines and the, uh, the, uh, Sticking to the rules and and trying wh where you can waiver you do but for the most part sticking to uh, what you set in place to keep the uh, to keep the court functioning um, because that consistency is what's going to give the confidence uh, from both a staff perspective but also um, the, the the patrons of your court and whether that be the litigants or whoever. Thank you. So let me walk through this with you. I think I'm too far away here. There we go. So why is governance so important? And a number of you hit upon this, but as you can see, obviously it supports our uh, independence, autonomy, and, and promotes organizational consistency. I can't tell you how important it is that those outside of us, whether it's the public, whether it's our funding authority, or whether it's the legislative or executive branches, how much they know and look for, to us to, to be better at governing ourselves. Historically, as we talked about this, we're, as court systems, eh, governance is, it's there. You know, we have, we have this balance we have to struggle with, with individual justice and individual cases vis-a-vis -vis organizational consistency. And that is one of the reasons why governance is so important, because it, it provides that forum that allows us not only to, to manage, but show everyone we can manage ourselves. It builds that trust and confidence. Yes, when, in my case, when the board says, yes, we approve everything you've asked for, Here's $320 million, go do your thing. That's what happens when you have an organization that has a well-defined and operating governance structure and takes care of its business. It builds that trust in all of those stakeholders. And uh, lastly, and in my opinion, very important, that organizational thinking, because generally we don't do that. We, you know, I started my career way back with a two-judge court, and governance was, Hey, Ray, this is what I need you to do. That's governance. <laughs> that was today, I mean, obviously, 30 some years later, in an environment where you have a forum or forums. We have multiple forums where this organizational thinking, which allows us to 
Analyze what we're doing. Self-analyze. Take a look. And governance provides that umbrella of um, the means to do it. And I heard someone mention strategic planning. And those of you that are here from my court know I'm a strategic planning lunatic. I believe it. We do it. <laughs> we do it every three years. Um, and this is the, the actually the umbrella I use, along with the presiding judge, to make that happen. Because we have to plan, short and long. That, again, lends itself to the trust and confidence that others have in us. If we're really looking at ourselves, how do we get better? And governance provides that forum. Very briefly, I mean, you folks know this. This isn't something new, but governance certainly embraces the rule of law and those principles. And as you know, the judicial branch has a piece in every one, not exclusively, but we are a piece of that. And this is, should be a fundamental tenet of everyone's governance structure, the support of our rule of law. And lastly, so m many of you, I, I put this chart together actually like 15 years ago. And it wasn't for a governance class. It was for um, an employee, you know, how do we build morale and, and maintain good um, working relationships with our, with our employees. So I took the procedural justice, procedural fairness concept where on the left, and we all know that, right? The Tom Tyler work um, years ago of in the courtroom, if you're listened to, if you believe the judge was impartial, if they, they tra treated you with courtesy and respect, you had more confidence in what that judge was doing, whether or not he or she ruled in your favor or not. If you apply that same concept, those same procedures, the same thoughts, the idea of people in your organization, this is what I believe you get. If your employees believe that you listen to them, if your employees believe that you treat us fairly, if your employees believe that, again, that you are treated with courtesy and respect, they tend to lend, its, uh, lend trust to the organization, which can do nothing more than promote morale amongst the, the employees. So I use this because this also can be a fundamental tenet of any governance structure, procedural fairness, procedural justice. And so I added that today for just a, a little bit of a conversation. And I'll turn it now back over to Marcus. I think this is yours. Thanks, Ray. Here. So I wanted to just ask, thank you. I just wanted to ask, how many of you actually work at a AOC at the state level? So a fair number of us. Okay, very good. And, and then the rest of you folks are mostly local court folks, is that right? And how, how many of you are in a federal court system? You bankruptcy or otherwise? Okay, yeah, thanks. This is such a great mix here. We talked this morning about diversity. Uh, yeah, it's terrific. Um, well, that's where I wanted to spend the little limited time we have today is to kind of talk about that working relationship, which is not easy, right? Um, Again, I'll refer you to the materials. They trace the whole history of hierarchical military type organizations, and it's worth a read, I think. And I think we all know we've tried to shift now to more participatory management, right? We try. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but this whole state local uh, court is the piece that sort of fascinates me. And uh, we'll also, I think that's probably a good uh, segue into the loosely coupled systems. Um, for you AOC folks, can I just ask what, um, what are some strategies maybe that you use to try to work with the local courts that you maybe you found, uh, I know it's not easy, but some things that maybe have been uh, effective in your work there. Anybody want to chime in? Yeah, please, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. In Texas, right now, at least where I sit, is we've, I've tried to just be more present in the courts themselves and make myself available to them. So that's direct outreach, that's going in and doing face-to-face, -face, that's inviting them into our work and helping them understand what, what the AOC or the OCA is attempting to accomplish and what that can do to help their work forward so that they don't feel so cut off from the legislature coming down on them or the changes that are coming away every two to three years. Michael. Yeah, Michael, thank you for sharing. So kind of like management by walking around, right? But really trying to be in their world and but then I imagine also listening and as well. So let's hear from, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, I can't see your name, but. From Illinois. I, I have your old job and he has your even older job. Um, <laughs> good to see you. So um, what we try and do is get the, the trial court administrators in Illinois together on a monthly basis. Sometimes those meetings are short and sweet, and sometimes there's good, robust discussion, but we try and make sure that they happen. 
um, because the, the collective wisdom of the court administrators, they'll reach out to each other individually. There's a listserv for them, but getting them together is important to, for just discussing what, what, what has happened at the state level and what, and it's, it's useful for me too, because I also work with the chief judges in the state. So if there's something that, that's brewing in the TCAs, I can bring it to the chief judges as a body as well. Terrific, yes, good to know things are well in Illinois. Let's flip hats or just change hats. Any court administrator or one of you local folks want to talk about how you try to work with the headquarters, if you will? There's no right or wrong answer, but just something that you found to be pretty helpful. I'm happy. I don't know. I'm going to have to go to Mark, I guess. I don't know. What's it like here? Okay, you, you run several counties, if I understand, right? Here in Florida, but you have a, a strong AOC in Tallahassee, I think. So go yeah. ahead. Right. Um, so kind of like what they do in Texas, only in the reverse, so rather than the, the AOC reaching out to us, it's not uncommon for the trial court administrators to do the reach out in the reverse and, and just to maintain those uh, lines of communication, if you will, with, with, the, with the state office. And it, personal opinion, I think it works pretty well. Mark, yeah, thank you. Well, I'll tell you, when I started with all this, I was so naive when I think back, okay? There was a lot of infighting between the central office and, um, Cook, and, and, the, and the Cook County Court, which is Chicago, right? And, and I just thought, this must just be a personality conflict, okay? Or these are very large egos, right? You, you know? And uh, certainly there was some of that, okay? Um, and I always thought, if we could just be nicer, right? Uh, we can work together. But what's, what's interesting, I think there really are different perspectives that make this difficult, even if everybody is trying to work together, right? And you have really good people. And I, I'm so glad Pam's here. You had worked as a state court administrator in Maryland, right? And so it's, it's great to have you here. Um, but let's think about it from, from the state perspective, they are typically gonna look at big picture, and this is really true at the federal level. You think about the AOC, think about that for a minute. At the federal level, okay, to look at when we think about automation and case management. And so because of that, they're going to certainly want some kind of uniformity. You'll hear about standardization of all the court forms, right? They should all be the same. And if, if we have a project, it should be run pretty much the same staffing patterns and the like. Um, and then they're certainly going to look for best practices in your local courts, right? And once we have it, what do we want to do at the state office? We want to spread that across the whole state, right? And we'll even maybe give you a little money, okay, to help with it. And so that's kind of the emphasis there. And uh, I, I think the, the effective AOCs have really kind of captured that, and, but they try to include the local courts and so on. Um, but then I think of a trial court, and in my experience, that's where a lot of the innovation actually occurs. I'm going to have you think about this for a second. Self-service centers, that was not a state project, okay? They started in a local court to meet a need, okay? And then California and others said, we're going to run with that, and we're going to promulgate that across the whole great state of California. Um, I, I think that's been true for a lot of the um, community courts, the homeless courts, all those problem-solving courts. Uh, I think the drug courts were started right down the road here in Miami-Dade, right? It was, it was a local judge who saw that revolving door and said, we're going to go ahead and try to tackle that. So. You have these two very different perspectives. And so the curriculum, if you can go through into the material, talks about working together and especially with judicial councils. And Ray's got, a, I think, a couple slides on that we'll talk about. But that if you ever have an opportunity to serve on one of those councils, I would just urge the, local, the court administrators, grab that. If you're asked to serve on a work group, it's just such um, an opportunity to help build that collaboration, right? And, and you're all the stronger for that. So. Uh, but I, I, in my career, I feel like I've come a long ways to understand this and to understand that those perspectives have to kind of be brought together there. So Mary McQueen, we, she was mentioned this morning, National Center President. She's been intrigued about this, I think, probably 30-some years and just wondering, well, is there any other way to look at this? And uh, I guess she came across some readings, uh, some publications on loosely coupled systems. And uh, this is interesting. These would typically be organizations where you have highly trained, highly educated, credentialed professionals who tend to work independently. Does that sound familiar, right? And the other sectors that they looked at would be hospitals. Think about the relationship of a doctor. Most doctors don't even affiliate with the hospital. They'll say, what, what do you do? Well, I'm a neurosurgeon, right? And then secondarily, they might tell you what I have privileges at these five different hospitals in this clinic, right? And um, the same, I guess, is true with professors, academic folks doing research. They will relate to their field and the expertise in that field, but they could be at any university. They might even work with two or three universities and so on. 
So Mary kind of said, gosh, that sure sounds like our judges, right? The trial uh, judges and then trying to work with court administration. Uh, these kind of organizations um, are, are very decentralized, federated, if you will. And there's always that tension we talked about with AOC, right? Between we want accountability standardization and the professors and the judges would say, yeah, but I need more autonomy. Don't get into my area of judicial discretion and the like. Uh, it notes here that there may be some sort of unpredictable connections, which I think that's kind of exciting. That would be the opportunity uh, to work with other partner agencies. Or in your local court, it might be a family court project working with juvenile court, right? So you've, that's sort of something we never thought about. But gosh, it's the same family. It's the same clients, if you will. Um, and then um, you also have this uh, kind of a funny yin and yang where uh, some of the judges want to be very specialized. I only handle complex civil. Does that sound familiar? Or commercial cases. That's my highest, best use. Others are saying everybody ought to serve on the family court bench and maybe even have a mixed calendar. So there's that kind of tension. If you read through the material, what's interesting, if you really embrace this, and for me, it really does kind of fit. There are several strategies you can use then to kind of manage and govern in this in this kind of a way for decision making, and the first is a, 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 the uh, administration would develop legitimacy, right, credibility, by helping with resources. And I think about the work that you folks do as court administrators or the AOC, bringing in every source of grant funding, uh, user fees, and, and the like, and just making sure that everybody that the specialists, the judges and so on, have the equipment they need, they have the programs and services they need. Uh, and then the second is to um, uh, allow some of that individual work, but to kind of celebrate that and where you can, kind of what we mentioned with AOCs, best practices to say, is that something that we would do across the whole enterprise, right? Uh, but the, the notion is to sort of accept that this is a crazy world. It's not traditional military sort of hierarchy, and then try to sort of leverage that, right? And uh, I, where you can do that, I think it's pretty effective. Um, anybody, anybody tried to operate that way? I'll just ask you that. Or have anything you want to share with us? I expect some of you folks are doing that now, okay? But but it's the, the readings are really pretty helpful on this, and I, I think it's it's nice to look at some other sectors to know we're not alone in the work we do here. Go ahead, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead. Okay, so let's talk now a little bit about the how. How do you do this? If you're interested in improving your, your governance structure or, quite honestly, creating one, how do you do this? And so we're not going to get into all these details. Again, the curriculum will take you step by step through how you may want to do this and what you may want to look at. Um, one of the things, and I'm going to talk a lot, lot about, but one of the things you need to be up on is those change management, management principles understanding what change does to your organization and how you may be able to respond and address that. So please, um, if you're thinking about making some significant changes, make sure you're, you are um, sufficiently educated in those areas. So organizational culture. Tell me what your organizational culture is. She works. You put me on the spot because I, <laughs> I work. No, um. I think there's one of the things that I appreciate about the culture is there definitely seems to be a genuine interest in seeking out the input of staff. That when, and then when that feedback is obtained, there's an effort to actually incorporate that into some of the strategies and build initiatives around that to make improvements. Who else wants to share their organizational culture? When I say that, so we have up here this inherent conflict and that's been around a long time. Although I gotta be honest with you, I think it's waning a bit. I think as we grow as organ organizationally and as, as a system, and that that's waning a bit. But in your quarters, there's still this inherent conflict between judges and system people like us, court managers, court administrators. Is there? Yes, please. One of the things I would talk about is I find that we're often responsible as court admin to issues versus being collaborative to try to build on the front end. So I, I do find that there is sometimes that more conflicting because it's always problem, you know, resolution, problem resolution, instead of building something together. Anybody else want to share in your court? How does this, do, do you still see this? May I ask there two judges? <laughs> do you look at court administrators? Do you look and say, you guys, 
don't understand enough about what we do in this courtroom every day. You're too worried about the system rather than what we're doing every day for individualized justice in individual cases. Since you have set up the question, <laughs> I'm going to bridge to a different answer. <laughs> okay. And, and, and this is a plug for Kevin and his public relations. Make sure you understand that. Okay. But there are two silos that sometimes they meet, sometimes they don't meet. Um, the, there are some administrative offices that say you're required to have the same level of competency, i.e. continuing education on both sides, judicial and staff side. Okay. And if that happens, then there may be some merger of meetings. Now, there's one other judicial officer here in this room now. I'm here, okay, because I need to know what my staff knows so that I can address them and meet them where they're at going forward. And I think that's important for me to be a better leader in, in the court system as a chief judge, as a presiding judge. And so, yeah, it, it, it affects my time, but I also know that you know the culture is one that I want to be open and have trust, okay? And, and my definition of trust comes from a movie, having confidence that what someone tells me, they're being honest about it, okay? And, and that's what I, need, I, I insist on. I'm gonna give you the tools, I'm gonna let you run with it, but you tell me what you need and let's go. Did an excellent job of redirecting. <laughs> Kevin, would you like to speak? Re rebuttal? No. <laughs> Ray, you had mentioned that you had, you, you've seen recently an improvement in some of these areas. I, I feel, do I, can I quantify it, Kevin? No, but I, I feel it. I have had the same sense, but I think in part, when I got into the business years ago, there was an understanding among most court administration that we were there to serve the judges. That was the focus. We needed to make the judges successful. We needed to make the judges look good. And I think over time, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that at all. I think that can be part of our calling, if you will. But I think where I'm seeing it more of a change is that there's more of a focus on the public we serve. And that's coming both from the bench, um, where you have these collaborative governance structures between court management and the judiciary, um, where we understand that we're not there to serve ourselves, we're there to serve the public. And that all of what you're talking about, whether it's the accountability issue and a, the good use of public tax dollars, to serve the public, not to serve ourselves. If we're gonna use technology, how do we use it most effectively to make the user experience better and, and to improve that? And the judges have their swim lane in terms of focusing on individual cases and making sure justice is served. And from an administrative standpoint, we have our swim lane as well in terms of managing the business of the operation in such a way that it's gonna provide that best possible outcome for the public. Excellent, thank you. Anyone else want to comment on this? We have okay, back, back here. here. <laughs> oh, you have them? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, sir. Uh, thank you. The, the judge in the front, esteemed judge in the front, referenced uh, the silos that exist. And that was exactly what I encountered when I stepped into my role about seven years ago. And I would call it even uh, like polarized silos, where it was a complete us and them, us versus them. And it's taken a lot of work to... Uh, basically shift that paradigm to say, you know what, we there is room for, we, we have our individual uh, uh, swim lanes, as uh, the gentleman in front just said, but there's room for collaboration. And just trying to, I guess, dismantle that, that original structure that said it's us and them to make room for the, you know, the, the, the collaboration has been, like, I've had to use some change management uh, mm. tactics and, and, and principles to try to make it work. But it's still, it's deeply entrenched in that uh, 
it's been a little harder than I would have expected, but we've made a lot of progress, and I think that, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Real quick, how many of you feel there's still a little bit of a struggle going on between what we do, we, the majority of us in here are on the administrative side, I assume, and those on the bench? Do you, do you still feel it, some of you? I mean, sure. And I, I agree with Kevin, it's not quite as bad as it used to be, or not as prevalent, not bad as it used to be, but sometimes it's still there. I'm sorry, I need to get through here because I know we're running. So I, I, understanding your culture is absolutely part of the assessment you have to do. And I, I, you know, there's, I've put these in forms of question for you. Again, they're in the curriculum. You know, how are decisions made in your court right now? If you're looking at a telework policy, how did that telework policy get made? Can you answer that, most of you? Was it the right way to do it <laughs> or not? That's another question. Um, as we talked before, understanding how your judges get into leadership positions, you need to be able to understand that. Will a shared leadership be endorsed? What do, I, what do we mean by shared leadership? A governance body is a shared leadership model. Um, do you believe your organization is accountable and, transpa and, and transparent? Do you operate with autonomy and independence from your sister branches of government and their stakeholders as well? And are, how well do you communicate, really? And as I said earlier, if, if you're going down this path, before you do anything more, take the uh, assessment. It's only about 10 or 12 questions, and you can give it to others within your organization, too. Not just yourself, but um, you know, other judges, other um, people in court administration, to get their opinion on where are we at with can we can we um, take take some steps to improve our governance. Um, again, next step after that is done. Again, I've got I've identified, defined, designed, and communicate. Kind of condense this all into one short slide. But um, these are in detail. Uh, we, I've detailed those out and steps you need to take with respect to those building blocks to good governance. And I'm going to stop here, and somebody's going to say, what does a productive pair have anything to do with governance? In my humble opinion, and this is only learned, this is not any of any book, in my humble opinion, it is the key. As an administrator with the leadership judges or leadership judge, I need to have this, this relationship before we start down the governance path of expanding a shared leadership. And some of you have probably heard this, productive pairs, no light between us, right? Isn't that what you and your presiding say all the time? There's no light between us. <laughs> but I believe this is the key to that. And how do you get there? There's, again, we've, we've um, I think Nakem has some information online about this as well. But, you know, if, if you're unfamiliar with, gee, how do I, how do I improve my relationship with my presiding judge? Or even when you start a new one. And there are some real things you can do, concrete exercises you can do. For instance, a building trust through negotiation. What is it that I do and what is it that you do? And can we talk about that? Um, clarifying decision rights. How many of you in here right now work with judges and you're still not sure of what your authority is or where your decisions, what you can make independently? Nobody? Come on, I see some smiles. Raise your hand. Come on. <laughs> hey, it's, don't be shy. I'm sorry. Oh, you want to talk? I want to talk. So it's a tough thing, but you can work through this. It's, it's not easy sometimes, but um, to, to the heart of, of governance is that productive pair relationship between the administrator and the presiding judge. Um, very quickly, I got the sign. We got, what, a couple minutes? Quickly, again, the curriculum has a way for you um, to evaluate how well your structure is doing. And I strongly recommend this because if you start with a governance structure and you don't go back and ask people who are being affected by that structure, how are we doing? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? What should we change? You do those things and you build confidence from your organization. If you just put one into place and say, this is what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, and they have no input, they being employees or even stakeholders, 
um, you're going to lose some co trust and confidence in that organization. Again, the curriculum <laughs> gives you specific ways in which um, why you should do it, what should be evaluated, who should be consulted when you evaluate, and how do you conduct it, both quantitative and qualitative methods. Um, that's tomorrow's governance. Hopefully, in most of our, as we stand here, it's our today's model and what the absolute attributes of what that governance should be. Shared, inclusive, accountable, transparent, yes, and innovative. Innovative. That's where we should, um, from this governance structure, should come sh um, some innovative thoughts and ideas and topics and ways to improve your court system. I got the sign back there. <laughs> so we will pause right there. I don't know if Marcus had anything, any concluding remarks. Um, if you have any specific questions of Marcus or I um, that you don't want to ask now, you, can, you still have a couple minutes, right? So, so go ahead. Back you. Sorry. You mentioned evaluation and, and tools for that. Do you have resources for that? There, there's some with the curriculum in the when you go online. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions on anything about court governance. Oh, yes. Ray, you mentioned that you're a strategic planning aficionado. You think that's, uh, okay, lunatic. I can agree with that. Uh, um, so when you think about governance, do you think about that and trying to establish it as part of your strategic planning? Or do you need to have this in place and operational before you start a strategy, exactly? How do you lay that out if you're in a jurisdiction where there need, perhaps needs to be some help on both sides? What do you think? <laughs> I think it was a great opportunity to ask you a question. <laughs> Can't you tell? We do know each other. Can you tell? <laughs> it's situational, I guess. I think either way would work. But we, um, we have a governance structure in place. Um, and from that emanates the drive to, okay, we need a strategic plan, again, every three years. So we map it out. Do we, and I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question correctly, but within that plan, do we do things to improve our governance? Was that a question? We have, I will tell you, this particular year um, where we have 14 projects, which just started on July 1st, 14 different projects uh, comprised of committees made up of our employees, judges, and the like on different topics. We don't have anything with respect to governance, although we have one project with no committee, and it's the presiding judge and I, because one of the things you have to do in governance is look at your allocation of your judicial resources. We are bringing in outside help to help us look do we have the right number of judges assigned to criminal? Do we have the right number of judges assigned to family? So that is a governance piece. And I don't know if I'm answering your question, but it goes back and forth both ways. But that's the one that is specifically related to governance in our strategic plan this year. Any other questions for Marcus or I? We're good? Oh, well, we don't have to stay five minutes. No, the last one ran over. We can get you out early. If you're, look, you're ready to go. I can see it. <laughs> you want to run? <laughs> get me out of here. <laughs> Listen, we're not that bad, are we? Any other thoughts? Yeah. Thanks. I was just going to share just a little bit about communications. I'm always surprised that it, I'm at the AOC now, and, and uh, some of my colleagues, that, I, that how many staff don't even know about, let's say, our Arizona Judicial Council, right? So a simple, uh, typically you wait for the minutes, right? It takes about a month to <laughs> really have good, clear, clean minutes. But just four or five bullet points coming out of that meeting and to get that out to the whole office, okay, can be so helpful. And, and for folks to understand, oh, yeah, that was a big meeting. Now I see what they're doing with court security or what they're doing with the uh, um, drug court program. And so do think about that because I, I think sometimes it's almost like uh, insider baseball. We all know we're really into this, right? But 
even our third, fourth level in the office may just not be aware. And then they do wonder like, yeah, how, how did you set the remote policy? Or are, are we the same as the other agencies? Or who did that? Or when is that? So do think about that. Um, can use newsletters if you want. Uh, I, I think some some courts are just pushing this out uh, on uh, you know the email system and whatnot. And you may even post some of it. I think I'd, I'd like the idea of maybe even having it on some of these screens. We've got conference rooms, right? Everything is just set up with. And so just think about how you can get the word out and, and make the staff part of uh, uh, the kind of the decision making process. Trying to include them as well, but let, that, let them really know what's cooking. So. I don't know if the others have any suggestions on that, but a lot of this, I think, comes down to communications, even if you have a good structure. And one of the things, real quick, if you, if you are, seriously, uh, how can we get better at this? And, 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 or can we start a new one, or do we need to change? One of the things I didn't touch on, but I think was in the slide somewhere, and I apologize, we're going through pretty fast. But if you know, if you know somebody in a court, another administrator or whatever, and you're kind of jealous that Man, they run themselves pretty well, don't they? And you're kind of, you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel at each court. Pick their brain. What are they doing that you're not? Um, and particularly if you're looking at same size, because cultures and governance models, as I said before, there's no one size that fits all. And I know if I told you our governance structure right now, you'd go, really? That's crazy. But we're pretty big. Um, and But so if you can, Seek out people who may, you know, it's kind of the same size court. Okay, tell me what you're doing. How do you, how do you make decisions when you pass the telework policy? A question like that. What happened? How did you do that? Um, and so you can just pick each other's brains on that and learn from each other because there are some very, very good governance models and courts doing it um, much better than we are. Um, but um, so it's your colleagues are your resources as well. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ray, I, I know in your Pennsylvania days, you had a, a number of presiding judges with different styles. Uh, I'm thinking of one who would say, uh, I'm the court, you're the administrator. Now, how would you approach when you, when you get a new presiding judge who maybe has very different ideas than you or very different ideas from the way things were done to try to get them, I don't want to say on board, but more aligned with the current culture? Well, and I showed you that productive pair, and I, I'm not kidding you. Um, first of all, you can't run head first in. I may be, I've been in these jobs for many, many years, but I get a new presiding judge. It's a whole new ball game. It's all new. Don't think just because you're, you've, perhaps in your job you've been successful for 25 years, that they are gonna mold themselves around you. No French, Your Honor. <laughs> but that's not gonna happen. And, and I, you know, we're a bit of a chameleon. I found that out. What I have always done historically is, is try to do exactly that before they even became productive pair. All right, tell me where, what, what do I do? What, what do you want me to do? And if it isn't where you want it, you don't say, I'm out of here. You'll work at it. You'll work at it, slip little by little. Okay. Um, and what I've also found is most, uh, and it depends on how long their term is, but a lot of our, Newer judges come in with goals, ideas. This is what I'm going to do, and let's go. All right, let's go. What I find is <laughs> that learning about the organization, and I, I joke about Maricopa County Superior Court is not a, a speedboat. We don't turn them on a dime. We're like a big oil tanker. We turn very slowly <laughs> to any changes. And so they learn that you can't just say it and it will happen and so then they be, then they come to you for help rather than and so the the dynamic changes and that's when you become that pair of okay and and most of my judges including the one he referenced at the end i have never had one bad separation from a presiding judge ever every one of them um and we had some rocky starts at the end considered to be friend um because we worked together so, and that's why I put that one slide up because people are saying, what does that have to do with governance? It has everything to do with governance, that productive pair relationship. And I don't mean to beat it into your head, but it's true. <laughs> so don't know if that answers your question, but um, how I approach it, Marcus, you may have a different approach. I think we're about done. 
Yeah, just just that if you do have a good governance structure, it's going to really help. So folks will understand why were some of those earlier decisions made, and uh, they're going to more likely be on board. I think it also through the committee or the governance structure lets you identify sort of that next wave of um, leadership judges. You sort of know who's coming in line and try to include them on uh, field trips and some of the projects and whatnot. And uh, But there is a funny adage. Remember Ernie Friesen? Everybody remember Professor Friesen? He always said, stay in with the outs because the outs will someday be in. <laughs> and and that's that whole crazy world of judicial politics, right? And so, But I, I think it's good management, too, to say we, it's not just a one judge, one administrator show. We've got the same dynamic with the family court or the juvenile court presiding judge. And, to try to be inclusive there as well. So you folks have been so attentive, despite all of our audio problems. <laughs> so uh, we're really grateful. And we want to continue the discussion. So um, do, do take a look at this new uh, draft here. Well, it's not draft. It's final. It's official. OK. Do look at the materials. Love to talk to you more about it. If you have other ideas for us, too, we'd love to pass that back to the NACOM uh, board as well. But uh, thanks for your, your attention, folks. And uh, I'm going to pass it back here. OK. Thank you.